Let's turn in the Word of God this evening to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. This evening we'll consider the first verse of this chapter. Preaching a series through this book at Trinity and last week Sunday preached on the beginning of chapter 6. So I'd like to do that again for you this evening, but in light of that let's read this sixth chapter of First Timothy. That as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition, drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast, pro- and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he will show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. (coughs) O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some men professing have heard concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. So far we read the inspired word of God. Let's read together again just that first verse of this chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke Count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed.
Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the question that the sermon will ask and answer this evening is this. How do you view and how do you treat your employer? That's a pertinent question to consider this evening. That's a pertinent question to consider in the first place because many of us sitting here this evening are called to work. God has ordained it in such a way that the means by which we provide for our families and for ourselves is through work. And so for many of us sitting here this evening, tomorrow morning we're going to wake up and we're going to go to work. In the second place, this is a pertinent question to consider this evening because for those who are called to work by God, that work consumes a significant part of your life. The fact is, is that we don't work a few hours in this week to come, a few hours on a few days, but for most of us, if we're called to work, the calling is to work hard, to work all week, so that we are able to provide for our families and the church. And for something as significant as our work, therefore, it's not surprising that often in the Word of God, God teaches us concerning that area of our lives. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. He teaches us the manner in which we are to view and treat our employers. The theme of 1 Timothy is proper behavior in the church of God. That's evident from chapter 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The entire epistle surrounds itself around that main idea. How the members of the church of Jesus Christ are to behave themselves. And so in the course of this epistle, what Paul does is address various segments of the church. If you read throughout the entire epistle, you would see that he addresses, for example, the women in the church. He addresses the elders and the deacons in the church. He addresses the widows in the church. And here in chapter 6, at the beginning... What Paul does is address another significant part of the church, those who were slaves at the time that this was written. They need to know what their calling is in the circumstance of life that they have been placed in by God. And their calling with respect to their masters is that they are to honor them. That's the Word of God that we consider this evening. To do so under the theme, the calling to honor unbelieving masters. We'll see later in the sermon that that's the particular situation that Paul addresses. The calling to honor unbelieving masters. Let's notice in the first place the historical context. In the second place, let's see the sharp exhortation. And then let's consider in the third place the God-honoring purpose. Calling to honor unbelieving masters. The historical context, the sharp exhortation, and the God-honoring purpose. Just a moment ago in the introduction, I said that this text addresses how an employee views and treats his employer. The fact of the matter is, however, that that is not the specific language of 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. The language of 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 is not employer and employee. It's clear that the language is that of servant and master. And more literally, as is the case in most places when servant is found in the New Testament, the better translation is slave. And so, I can't simply go from servant or slave and master to employer and employee without explaining myself a little bit. As we'll see, that is the present day application of a text like this. But what gives us the right to jump from what is the clear language of the text? And there's no getting around that. He talks about slaves 
and masters. What gives us the right to jump from that relationship to the present day relationship of employer and employee? What we need to do, therefore, in the first point of the sermon is lay a little bit of groundwork. Explain briefly the Bible's teaching concerning slavery. The master-slave relationship. The problem, when we think about that relationship of master and slave, is that it immediately conjures up in our minds and in our thoughts certain images and certain thoughts. We're Americans living in the 21st century. Certainly most of us have learned about American history and learned about European history. And so when we think about master and slave, the first thing that comes to mind most often is what took place in Europe and then what took place in our own country in its early history. The slave trade that originated in Europe and then that came to America, that terrible, brutal, godless system in which Europeans went to Africa against the will of those Africans, enslaved them, put them on ships, oftentimes in the decks, below the decks of those ships, treated them in brutal ways, many of them dying on the way over here. And then when they got to America, they were sold into slavery and treated often by their masters in a way that was even below the animals that that same master owned. We've read the history. We've seen the images. That's what comes to our minds when we think about masters and slaves. But what is the Bible's teaching concerning that relationship? And the fact is that the Bible does not condemn slavery as such. But the Bible condemns, rather, the abuses of slavery. And when I use that word slavery, I'm referring to the social relationship in which there is a man who is over another man. So that this man does the bidding of and works for and is controlled by his master. The Bible does not condemn that relationship as such, but I say again, rather it condemns the abuses of that relationship. The fact that the Bible does not condemn it as such is evident from a couple of things. It's evident from even a text like this, where the Apostle Paul clearly is teaching those who were in the church of Ephesus how they were to conduct themselves within that relationship. God acknowledges the fact that they are in this relationship of master and slave, and He tells them, as those who are in this relationship, this is how you are to conduct yourself. And this is not a lone passage in this regard. Titus 2 verse 9, for example, says the exact same thing. Exhort servants or slaves to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things not answering again. That the Bible does not condemn this relationship as such is also evident from the book of Philemon. Philemon was a master. He had a slave who had ran away, Onesimus. And Paul encounters Onesimus, who was converted to the Christian faith. And having encountered Onesimus, a runaway slave, he writes back to Onesimus' owner, Philemon. And the word of the Apostle Paul to Philemon was not, cease being a master, Philemon, but rather, Philemon, receive back your slave Onesimus. But now receive him back not only as your slave, but receive him back now as your fellow brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not speak against the relationship as such. What the Bible condemns 
are abuses of that relationship. The fact is that the Ten Commandments, particularly the second half of the law, the last six commandments, apply to all relationships. They apply to the relationship of a husband and a wife. They apply to a relationship of parents to children, the fellow brothers and sisters in the church. And yes, they would apply to this relationship of a master and a slave. And what is the heart of those second six commandments, or that second part of the law? The heart of it is to love your neighbor as yourself. If you were living at the time or in a circumstance in which this is the way it was in the society and culture of the day, those laws, those commandments of God would apply to that relationship as well. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul even condemns an abuse of this relationship in this epistle. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, in 10, he speaks about this. In verse 9, he's talking about the law. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for a lawless and disobedient. And then he lists all these sins in the second half of verse 9 and 10. One of which, in verse 10, is men stealers. Notice that. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars. That's not simply just a reference to kidnapping. It's a reference to an abuse of what was an institution that played an important role at the time this was written. Masters abusing the relationship with respect to their slaves. Furthermore, when you consider the nature of this relationship at the time Paul wrote this to Timothy, you would see that in reality it resembles very much what we experience today with an employer and an employee. It's estimated that about one-third of the Roman society at this time was enslaved. And this is not to say that there were not masters who, like in the early history of our country, abused their slaves and took advantage of the situation. But nevertheless, for many, they operated in a very similar way to how employees operate today. Slaves, even at this time, had legal rights. They were able to bring their masters to court when they were abused by their masters and not treated well by their masters and oftentimes even win. The Emperor Claudius, for example, put a law into place at this time that said that masters had the responsibility to care for their slaves after those slaves were no longer able to work for them. In other words, they couldn't use them. And then once they were old and unable to work, throw them by the wayside and be done with them, the law said, you need to provide for them. Even in their old age, a present day form of a retirement fund. You put the work in, and you're worthy to be cared for after the fact. Many people back in that day actually even put themselves willingly into this relationship of master and slave. Because in that day, that was the main way in which a man had his needs provided for. He sells himself into slavery, he works for a particular man, and in return, that man provides for his needs and his family's needs. And they even had a certain amount of freedom. And that's evident from simply this passage. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And clearly, by what he says here, there were slaves in that church. And as we'll see, slaves with unbelieving masters. Their masters were not part of the congregation, but they were. So they're in this relationship, but yet, they had the right and the freedom be part of a congregation and worship the Lord. 
All of that is said simply to justify the point that I am making that when we look at this passage, the relationship to which it applies is that of an employer and an employee. Especially when you heard me explain in the last few minutes what it was like for some slaves, you see that there really are not many differences. We are underneath, if we are an employee, another man. We do the bidding of that man. If your employer says, be at work on Monday morning at 6 o'clock and work until 5 o'clock, you have to listen to him. No way around it. He's above you. It's a social relationship in which he is your master, so to speak. And within that relationship, there are freedoms. Here you are, still in the house of God, worshiping certain legal protection and all of the rest. The relationship resembles that of an employer and employee. Apostle Paul, in the beginning of chapter 6, addresses two certain types of situations having to do with that relationship of master and slave. In verse 1 of chapter 6, the Apostle Paul addresses the circumstance in which a slave is owned by an unbelieving master. Now it doesn't say that as such, but as we'll see in a little bit, that phrase, under the yoke, indicates a certain attitude of the master towards the slave. And that's evident from what we find in verse 2. Because there's a contrast between verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, Paul instructs slaves who have unbelieving masters, this is what you are to do. And then he gets to verse 2, and it begins this way, and they that have believing masters, and more literally it should be a contrast, but they that have believing masters, let them not despise them. So two specific circumstances of slaves with certain types of masters. We consider this evening just that first one, the exhortation to those who have unbelieving masters. The way we view our life in this world is such that we live in it, but are not of it. We live in this world, but are not of this world, meaning that as Christians, it is not our responsibility only to seek work by those who are Christians. We live in this world, which means at times it may be the case for some of you sitting here this evening, that you work for those who are not Christians. <clears throat> and when we think about the master, the employer, we need to be thinking not just only of the man at the top, the owner of the company, but if you're in the hierarchy of a company, you're working for someone, a boss. What's his relationship to God or lack thereof? Our view is such that at times may be the case that we do not work for those who are believers. I realize that for many of us sitting here tonight, you do work for believers. Maybe even in the church or our own churches, but living here in West Michigan, outside of our churches, but yet still for Christians. And not only that, it may be the case that you're on the other side here, not the slave, not the employee, but the employer, and I recognize that many here are that as well. Needless to say, this is the Word of God, and it's applicable really for all those who are working, and even more broadly, towards all of those who are in authority. Those are the overarching themes of this passage, and so it's still valuable to consider this Word of God. So don't just think that we're talking about honoring unbelievers. That's the specific situation, as we'll see. But nevertheless, the main idea and the exhortation applies to both. The Apostle Paul is identifying a specific situation 
It's a situation in which a slave, an employee, finds himself in a very difficult, burdensome situation at work. That's evident from what the Apostle says at the beginning. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor. Now the question is, when he uses that phrase, under the yoke, is he using that simply to identify the fact that he's a slave? Or is there something more to that? Is under the yoke a description of being a slave? Or is he indicating that there's something about this relationship that he's emphasizing? I believe it's the latter. That by using that phrase, under the yoke, Paul is highlighting the nature of this relationship. You work for an unbeliever who views your service in this way as though he's placing a yoke upon you. I say that because if you're a believer in verse 2 and a master, you're not treating your slave as one who is under the yoke simply not the case. As a believing master, a believing employer, as I said earlier, you're operating under the context of God's law and that of loving your neighbor as yourself. He's identifying a circumstance in which having an unbelieving master, a man finds himself in a very difficult situation. The yoke, obviously, in Scripture is a picture of something that is oppressive. It was the instrument that was placed on ox, oxen when they would go out into the field to plow. A very heavy, wooden instrument placed upon their necks. And the Bible uses that figure to describe that which is oppressive, that which is burdensome. And at times, you may be working in such a way that it feels as though you are under the yoke, squeezed down upon you so that your employer is trying to get everything out of you that he possibly can while giving back to you as little as he can. Maybe that's been the case for you in the past. Know about you, but it, it seems a little warm in here. I'm sweating, so we're going to do that. Maybe that was the case for you in the past or right now. You find yourself in a very difficult situation. Your employer requires of you that you work oppressively long hours. The pay is for what you do very minimal. Benefits are very meager. The vacation is simply non-existent, so it seems. You get the feeling day after day after day that it's squeezing down on you, sucking everything out of you. It's just the type of situation where you wouldn't be inclined to do what Paul says in this passage. Namely, honor that man. Everything about the circumstance would lead you to do just the opposite. Not honor. Show no respect for this man that is over you. I had a very interesting experience this past summer. I was able, as a member of the contact committee of our churches, to go to Australia to visit the denomination with which we have a corresponding relationship, the EP. CA, Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Australia. And when I stayed there, I stayed with an older couple. And the wife of this couple that I got to know quite well was originally from South Africa. She was married later in life to this man who was part of the churches in Australia and moved later in her life to Australia. But she described for me what her life was like in South Africa. Now, if you know anything about what's going on in South Africa, 
and what has gone on there in the past, you would know that it's a very racially hot area, so to speak. Serious racial discrimination. And the thing about this woman is that she was biracial. If you lived in South Africa and you were biracial, you are the most oppressed people in the country. She described for me her circumstances there when she was working prior to moving to Australia. She went to work every single day for an insurance agency, I believe. She worked side by side a white man, a white woman rather. And every single day she went to work knowing that this white woman that was next to me was making twice as much money for the exact same work. Exact same work, just as qualified, if not more qualified, making twice as much. Day in and day out. Everybody knew about it. She did. Her co-worker, obviously the boss for whom she worked. Imagine that. Obviously, we all don't make the same amount of money. Put yourself in that situation where you know everyone around you for the exact same work, and simply because of the color of your skin, is making twice as much. I bring that up because of the way in which she spoke about it. It was a wonder of grace, the manner in which she explained this to me. This is her totally removed from it, many years ago now. But yet the way that she explained it to me was such that there was still a certain amount of respect towards the one that was over her. If you're removed from it, I know what the temptation is and the way that she would speak about that man in that situation certainly wouldn't be what Paul says in this text. I was blown away by it. It left a deep impression upon me, the manner in which she labored in that context and spoke about it after the fact. It's a wonder of grace to be able to endure that. And still, by the way you handle yourself and speak about these things, do what Paul says here. Honor those who are over you. That's the main command of the text, as it says in the text. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. The second point of the sermon is entitled The Sharp Exhortation. Paul is sharp here, he's clear in what he says. There's no mistaking the point that he's making. Count them worthy. And then he adds this, of all honor. What's interesting is that Paul does not say simply honor them. If you find yourself working, you have an employer, he does not just say honor them, but he says significantly this, count them worthy of all honor. The idea of that word, count them worthy, is deem in your mind, reckon carefully in your mind, that these men are worthy of all honor. That's so important, beloved, because when you find yourself in a situation like this, the natural reaction is to do just the opposite. Paul says, step back as a Christian... That's called to live every sphere of your life to the glory of God's name. And think about this relationship. And when you do that, in your mind, deem this man worthy of all honor. He says very deliberately, very consciously, think about these things. And that's so important because if you find yourself in that situation and you just do what you're naturally inclined to do, it is certainly not that. We all know that from experiences. When things are difficult at work, when we don't like what the person above me 
is demanding that I do, and it's just not a good situation, the natural inclination is to be bitter, to be anger, angry, to be frustrated, to throw that man by the curve, as it were. Paul says, reckon him in your mind worthy of all honor. And then he adds that. All honor. And the idea is, don't just respect that man when you're talking to him. Face to face, certainly do that. Don't just respect that man when you're talking about him with your co-workers or at home with your wife or with your children. And that's a very important point here. That's how it applies to all of us. How are we talking about our employers in our homes? What are our children learning about work from the way that we speak about this relationship? But what's implied in that all honor is this, that you work hard for that man. You respect him for the position that he's in as an employer. You speak about him in the right way. And then you go to work. When everything about you says, I don't want to do this for this man, you go to work as God calls you to go, which is working hard for that man. Never, never is the way in which our employer treats us licensed for us then to sin. To jab back at Him by not giving our all and not working as we're diligently called to work. Count them worthy of all honor. This needs to be very real to us. Young people who are working. This is what you need to do. When you go to work after school tomorrow or on Saturday, how do you talk about your boss? I don't know where you as young people are working. I know at Trinity, it seems like there's always some at the egg farm. There's always people at the restaurants, Rainbow Grill. Russ's, Mr. Berger, and all of the rest, and many other places besides. But you guys are working. And I remember those days when you didn't want to come in on a Saturday morning, when you were told to come in on Saturday morning, and then 9.30 rolls around and it's break time, and you're sitting around with everyone else, and you're talking. How are you talking about your employer, your boss, believer or unbeliever? It needs to be with respect. Because God put that man in that position over you in the work that you are doing. Obviously not just for young people, but for all of us. We know how easy it is not to do this when things go tough at, get tough at work. We need to be very conscious of the way that we speak about and work for all of those who are over us. And God gives us in this passage a very specific purpose in doing this. And that's the end of the passage. That the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. God says, count them worthy of all honor, so that God's name and His doctrine be not blasphemed. The name of God is the revelation of who God is. God's name is different than our name. Our names are simply labels by which others refer to us. God's name is revelatory, meaning that the name of God has included in it not just a way that we refer to Him, but who He is. The name of God is God Himself. God is revealed to us especially in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. The doctrine of God are the teachings of God. All of those teachings of God that are set forth in His Word. And the heart of those teachings of God is what I just said a moment ago, Christ. 
All of the Word of God, and it doesn't matter where, all of it sets forth Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Beloved, you have the name of God upon you. Yes, you have a name given to you by your parents. But you have the very name of God upon you because you have in you the Lord Jesus Christ. And what you believe are the teachings of God, the heart of which is salvation through the precious blood of Christ alone. And the fact is, is that you carry that name and those teachings everywhere you go. Obviously, here in God's house on the Lord's day, when you walk out these doors tonight, when you who are working wake up tomorrow morning, when they address you by your name, you need to remember that there is another name upon me and in me and teachings that I believe and all of that is Jesus Christ. God says if you do not honor your employer, you blaspheme the name of God and Jesus Christ, the teachings of God. Blaspheme them. Trample them underfoot. You throw them in their mud. You live as though they mean absolutely nothing. That's the significance of what we are talking about here. The Gospel of Jesus Christ transforms us. Part of those teachings. We belong to a Savior through His precious blood, died for us on the cross, that Gospel transforms us. And it transforms us in such a way that we understand as believers the relationship that really matters. The relationship that really matters is your relationship and my relationship to God and the fact that that barrier of sin removed by the blood of Christ is the ground for our salvation and hope everlasting. That truth that we believe and that is on us every single day affects every sphere of our life. And what that means is that we can find ourselves in these very difficult circumstances at times where we feel like the yoke is pressing down upon us. But because of the Gospel, because of that name of God, because of those teachings that we believe, we can be at peace. We can be content. We can endure patiently day after day after day. Because I know that I'm right with God. And I have the hope of everlasting life. Imagine if it was the opposite. If every single day when you find yourself in these burdensome situations, you don't go forward with peace. You're not content. You're angry. You're bitter. You're frustrated. What are you doing? You're living as though this relationship here on this earth, this social relationship of employer and employee is everything to me, when in the end, we know because the Gospel transforms us that we're here for but a moment. And in the providence of God, He has placed me in this. And therefore, in the midst of this situation, I can be at peace. I can be content. And I can work hard day after day after day. If you don't do that, you're blaspheming. You're acting low as it means nothing to you. The very truth of Jesus Christ that you believe and that transforms you as a sinner. So that in the first place regarding why this is true. But more importantly in the second place, you despise the name of God and the teachings of God when you dishonor your employer. Because the Gospel transforms us in such a way that we obey God's commandments. 
One of those commandments that we obey is the fifth commandment. And the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. More broadly, as we know, that fifth commandment applies to all circumstances in which there is authority and those underneath. It's this relationship that God is speaking of in this text. And God says to us in the fifth commandment, when you honor those who are in authority over you, you are in fact showing honor me, who is God over all. And this is where it applies to everyone. Children, tomorrow you go to school and your teachers are in positions of authority over you. You're to honor them. Your parents, honor them. Elders in the church, honor them. But here in the text, employers, honor them. God has placed them in positions of authority. And in honoring them as those who are transformed by the gospel of Christ, you in the end honor God. But the opposite is true as well. You dishonor them. You show disdain and hatred for them. A lack of respect for them. It says something about your relationship to God. It blasphemes very name and doctrine of God. Those are the negative purposes. But in conclusion, let's see what is the positive purpose. When you find yourself in this circumstance, or for all of us who work, and when you show honor to your employee, employer, it has the positive effect of being a wonderful witness to those who are around you. Especially when he's an unbeliever. Especially when it's hard. Especially when you feel like the yoke is upon you. And now I'm not thinking so much about the witness towards that man, that boss, that owner. I'm thinking about the witness towards those that you are working with. How easy is it, in the absence of your boss or your employer, to throw them under the bus, to complain, to be bitter? But put yourself in that situation when you're talking to your fellow workers. And when all of that stuff comes up, you say, I'm not going to talk that way. We shouldn't talk that way about so and so. And by what you say and by what you don't say, make very clear that you are honoring the man that is over you. Young people, imagine that. Always we need to be looking for opportunities to witness. What a wonderful opportunity that is. Because I know it comes up and I know how we can complain about our bosses and our employers. When you have an opportunity, you say we shouldn't speak this way. He's our boss. He's our employer. I'm going to tell you why we shouldn't speak this way. Because I'm a Christian. And I have the name of God upon me. And I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that affects how I view this relationship. And not with frustration and bitterness, but now with joy, peace, and content. After that conversation... You go back to work. What a powerful witness in honoring those that are over you. God calls us to work. God calls us to work a lot in our lives. When you add up the hours, it plays a huge role in our lives. We work as Christians. We view our employers as Christians. May God give us the grace to do what He says in this text. Honor those who are over us. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank Thee for this word that we could consider this evening. We pray for Thy blessing upon it. We pray that 
Thou wilt work in such a way that those who are working go to work tomorrow and consciously reckon their employers worthy of all honor. Help us, O God, to live as Christians in every sphere of our lives. And where there is sin, we pray for humility to confess. We pray for forgiveness. For Jesus' sake, amen.